morning, church. I am delighted to be with you today, despite uh, any setbacks that we may have had. I'm happy to be here. Uh, Have I told you that I love my job? Uh, I'm not the best thing that ever happened to preaching, I know that, but I sincerely and truly love preaching the Word of God. And I hope that you enjoy hearing it and studying it with me as much as I enjoy preaching it. Today I want to deal with a subject that I have often said I believe is one of the most dangerous sins that exists in our world today and in the church today. One of the most dangerous traps that Satan has ever set for Christians, and that is covetousness. Covetousness is said in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 to be idolatry. And it's a very dangerous thing to be caught up in idolatry, of course. You see the results of that in the Old Testament. Time and time again, those people were caught up in idolatry. And you see the damage that it did to them as individuals and as a nation. As we embark on our study this morning in Luke chapter 12, open your Bibles if you have it there this morning. As we embark on this study, I want to to try to set the background of what's happening in the life of Jesus at this time. I, I want you to see clearly the context in which Jesus gives this teaching about covetousness. And to do that, we don't have to go very far back in the biblical record. As a matter of fact, if you, if you go back about halfway back in Luke chapter 11, look at verse 37 of Luke chapter 11. Here we, we're not going to read a bunch of this text, but beginning in Luke 11 and verse 37... Jesus had sat down to eat a meal with a group of scribes and Pharisees. Luke only says Pharisees, but if you turn to Matthew 15 in the parallel account, we see that there were both scribes and Pharisees there with him. And their chief complaint about Jesus on this occasion was the fact that he did not wash his hands before he ate this meal. Now, if you don't know anything about that, it was simply a Jewish tradition and a matter of, of, of good cleanliness and hygiene to wash their hands before a meal. And so they accused Jesus and say, well, you've broken the law of God. Well, you understand as well as I do that uh, washing your hands before you eat, as good as it might be for your health, was nowhere included in the law of Moses, nor is it included in the law of Christ. And so the scribes and Pharisees really didn't have any ground on which to stand in accusing Jesus. Yet, nonetheless, they proceed. Now, this is the situation Jesus finds himself in. So he, being able to look into their hearts, uses the opportunity to expose their religious hypocrisy. He tells them that they need to make sure that the inside was clean, which was the ultimate point of his teaching. As a matter of fact, in verse 39, I believe it is, the Lord said to him, Now, you Pharisees, make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Now, I don't know about you, but I recall growing up as a child when my mother would have me to wash dishes. Uh, Do you ever remember skipping a little part of that? Maybe... You make sure the outside is really nice and clean and it shines good, so you put it up in that cabinet, and it looks really good. And undoubtedly, Mother would go back and and she would take that dish down. Maybe it was a glass or a cup to, to get something to drink. She would look down in that thing, and she would just say my name. And I knew exactly what it meant and what she was about. See, I didn't wash the inside of the cup. And the point is, to wash the outside of that dish and leave the inside dirty does absolutely no good whatsoever, does it? And that's the same way the Pharisees and the scribes were treating their life. They they had a good outward appearance and everything about them appeared to be what it should be. But inside, they were full of, Jesus says, greed and wickedness. So Jesus exposes this hypocrisy. Now the goal of the Pharisees, if you drop down to verse uh, 53 through 54 of Luke 11, you understand that their goal was simply to trap Jesus. As he said these things, verse 53 says to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. And so this is what Jesus is up against. 
So by the time we come to Luke chapter 12, Jesus is really going to do some teaching for these scribes and Pharisees, the religious elite as they may have been referred to. In verses 1 and following of Luke chapter 12, we find that there's an innumerable multitude gathered together to listen to Jesus. And the text says there in Luke 12 that there were so many people gathered together on this occasion that they were trampling on top of one another. My, oh my, brethren, wouldn't it be good if we had that problem in this building today? People are trampling on top of each other just to hear the Word of God, and that's what's happening here. And I suspect that some of these scribes and Pharisees, this multitude that Jesus was preaching to, they probably heard it. They probably heard what Jesus was teaching. Now, all of this is brought about by what happened in chapter 11. The very first thing Jesus says, recorded in Luke 12, is this. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You say, well, that doesn't mean anything in relationship to covetousness, and we're not getting that far just yet, but I want you to understand clearly what's happening here. If you go back to Luke 11 once again, and look at verses 46 and 47, you see some of this hypocrisy that the scribes and Pharisees were caught up in. Jesus said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. How hypocritical would it be for me to say, All right, brethren, there's plenty of work to do, but you do it all. <laughs> and that's what the Pharisees and the scribes are doing. Verse 47 says, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. You see, they were so hypocritical because certainly, the next verse points out, verse 48, that they agreed with the fact that their fathers killed the prophets, and yet here they were trying to honor them by building them these great and fancy tombs. See, these were not good religious people. They were hypocrites. They were wicked. They were greedy people. And this is what Jesus is up against. Now, in verses 4 and 5 of Luke chapter 12, Jesus encourages them not to fear those who kill the body, but... Fear him who can kill the body and soul in hell. Verses 6 and 7, he teaches them about the care that God exercises for his people. Then in verses 8 through 12, he teaches them that great teaching on the importance of confessing your faith in Christ. And then, beginning in verse 13, he's going to teach them about covetousness. Let's jump right in. I want to do three things this morning. The first thing I want to do is explain this parable. It's relatively easy to understand, but we're going to go through it bit by bit and explain it. After we've done that, we're going to make some spiritual application for us today. And then having done that, we'll conclude by considering some lessons that we should learn. Let's look at this parable and explain it. In verse 13 of Luke 12, we have a petition. There is a petition made, one from the crowd. Remember this innumerable multitude. Jesus is in the middle of teaching, and one from the crowd, verse 13, said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now this is the petition that's made in the middle of these teachings. He wants Jesus to talk to his brother, divide the inheritance, give me what's mine. Maybe the man thought Jesus was a Jewish rabbi who had the authority to do this. I don't know. Nonetheless, there's some debate as to whether or not this man had a just plea or not. But really, it's not important in our study today. The thing we do need to understand is that the man in the crowd was apparently hearing the teachings of Jesus and just out of the blue randomly asked Jesus a physical question. Will you speak to my brother and tell him to do this? Uh, I, I would liken that today. Maybe if I'm standing here preaching and Somebody just from the crowd stands up and hollers, Preacher, what you having for lunch today? Now this matter was quite a bit more serious than food, okay? But nonetheless, right in the middle of this spiritual teaching, interruption with physical thought. And this position sets the stage for the parable that Jesus is going to tell because there was covetousness involved here. Maybe covetousness on the brother's part who had the inheritance. Maybe covetousness on the part of the brother who wanted the inheritance. Maybe both. That sets the stage for this parable. Now in verses 14 and 15, we have a principle. He said to them, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he, uh, he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, 
covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So in verse 14, Jesus clearly says what's wrong with a man's attitude. We know that Christ will be involved in judging of souls at the end of time. So therefore, he's not saying that Christ wouldn't be a judge in that matter. He's simply saying that Christ was not going to be the arbitrator in this physical matter. I'm not going to get involved with this because it's not in the scope of my mission. His mission, Luke 19 and verse 10, was to seek and to save that which was lost. And so he doesn't get involved. Jesus doesn't take part, but he does seize the opportunity to teach about covetousness. He says, essentially, man, your attitude is wrong. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Because your life doesn't consist in the things you possess. No, no, no. That's an everlasting truth. It's true today. Covetousness was a sin under the law of Moses, and it's a sin today as well. Man's life is more than physical possessions. That leads us to verses 16 through 20, this parable that Jesus tells. He spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there I'll store my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? That's the parable Jesus said. This man's ground was uh, good and fertile, and it brought forth a good crop. What a blessing this would have been. Do you know people, folks, who have a a huge garden? Russell was talking about gardens during the Lord's Supper. Do you know people with huge gardens? and, And their primary goal in having a huge garden is to bless the lives of other people. Do you know people like that? I've seen people who do that. They raise this gigantic garden and they toil and they sweat and sometimes bleed all summer long and they reap the harvest and they just share it with everybody. It's such a blessing in the lives of people. Well, that's essentially what this man could have done. It was a great blessing from God that he had so many crops and so many goods. He was apparently a man who was an honest and hard worker. And yet he had an attitude problem. So the man considers his position and and he plans for the future. He says, well, I I, I know what I'm going to do. I'll just tear my barn down and I'll build a bigger barn so I can just store it. And so you see here an attitude of greed, and he says, I'm not going to share it with anybody. I'm going to keep it for myself. That way I don't have to work in the future. That way I can just sit back, eat, drink, and everything is just fine. You see, what could have been used for a blessing and for touching someone else's heart, he kept for greed. And so the rich farmer is going to retire. Ultimately, God says he is a fool. He's a fool. You see, the man did not understand in the parable that his soul was going to be required of him that night. He did not understand that he was going to die. He did not understand that he was going to face the judgment. And God says, you are a fool. Because when you die, when you're gone, whose things will these be? There's a song I used to listen to, a bluegrass song. In the midst of that song, it said, You can't take it with you when you go. You never see a U-Haul pulled behind a hearse. Isn't that true? Uh, Maybe people have seen that before, but the truth is still the same. You can't take that stuff with you when you go. You can put it in the ground with your body. It'll just lay there and rot with your body. Think about it. The point is this in verse 21. The person who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God is like this farmer. If you have been blessed leaps and bounds by God and you're not sharing those blessings with others when you have opportunity and ability, you're just keeping it and you're greedy with it, you're covetous, you're just like this farmer. That's in short the parable explained. Let's think about some spiritual application. Just as Jesus did, friends, we need to seize every opportunity we have to teach others about God. I've thought about this and I've thought about it. I think there are two primary reasons people don't do this. Number one, they might be ashamed of it. 
you ask them, they say, no, I'm not ashamed of it. But when they get put in that position, they don't speak about Jesus. They don't talk about God's Word. They don't teach people the truth. And you know what Paul said, Romans 1 and verse 16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. We're holding in our hands God's power to save mankind. And if you cannot look at a lost soul and garner love in your heart enough to teach them the truth, you've got a much more serious problem than covetousness. Sometimes people might not teach others. They might not seize these opportunities because they don't know enough. That sounds kind of harsh, but that's the reality. People are not studying the Word of God today like they should. And maybe you and I could fall into that group. When you don't know the Scriptures, friends, the Bible says you will err from the faith. Matthew 22 and verse 29, Jesus said to a group of people, You do err not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. And so not only do you lose the opportunity to teach a soul, but you will wander away from the faith. So, just like Jesus sees opportunities to teach. Number two, just as Jesus taught then, we need to be aware of covetousness. Beware of it. Covetousness has always been a problem for mankind. Do you remember one of the Ten Commandments had to do with covetousness? As you read those commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, we read this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Don't covet what somebody else has. It's always been a problem. Colossians 3 and verse 5, Paul again says there that covetousness is idolatry. And he encourages the... Colossian brethren, to put it to death. Destroy that attitude of covetousness. And one way that we beware of covetousness is to be sure that we understand that our life is not about the things we own. Sure, those things are enjoyable, nothing wrong with them, but we need to make sure that we're keeping things in proper perspective. Be content with the things you have. For He has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13 And verse 5. Finally, we need to realize that we will all give an account of the way we lived our lives and the way that we used God's blessings. In Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, the wise preacher is coming to a conclusion in his book. He's looked out into the world and he says, All is vanity. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity, says the preacher. And the conclusion of his book is this. Let us... Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole of man. Some translations add the word duty there. I don't have a problem with that, but I believe it's adequate to leave it out. This is the whole of man. Fear God, keep His commandments. We need to learn that lesson. Realize that we're going to give an account of God. Now, in verse 14, he says that. There's coming a day when we will all face the judgment, the wise man said. Romans 14 and verse 12 says each one of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one will receive the things done in his body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Do you realize, friends, and do you keep it in the forefront of your mind that you will face the judgment? It'll go a long way in combating covetousness. So seize opportunities to teach. Beware of covetousness. Realize you'll give an account to God. Let's look at some lessons as we draw to a close this morning. Lessons we can learn from this parable. This is a little bit different kind of sermon than I normally preach. But I want you to think with me about some basic lessons we draw from this parable. Number one, we need to be focused on the spiritual. If you remember as I was reading the parable, or maybe as Dale read it for us this morning, remember Jesus is in the middle of preaching to people. And in the middle of that preaching, someone comes up to him and asks him a physical question. He, see, he's not, he's not focused on the spiritual. He's thinking about the physical. And friends, when we are focused on the physical rather than the spiritual, trouble will follow. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, Jesus famously said, 
Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then all these other things will be added to you. Don't think about the physical. You focus on the spiritual, then everything else falls in place. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, as Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven, a group of the disciples there, they, they, when they had come together, it says, they asked Him, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And what they were uh, thinking about, what they were focused on, was a physical, literal kingdom, not a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus rebukes them on that occasion for not being focused on the spiritual. You see, we need to focus on the spiritual. The kingdom is not of the world, therefore, don't think of it as if it were. Stay focused on the spiritual. Number two, covetousness can and will destroy your soul and mine. It can and will destroy our souls. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul says, The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's not money. It's not the things we possess. It's the love of those things. Loving those things so much that you do anything possible to get them. The love of money is the root of all evil. Covetousness will destroy your soul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul lists a bunch of unrighteous characteristics there. And his conclusion is that those who involve themselves in these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Would you be able to guess what is listed among those evil and wicked characteristics? Covetousness. He says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't fool yourselves, friends. Covetous people will not go to heaven. I know that because we have an example of a couple who were covetous. In, in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they were covetous people. They were greedy people. And, and as much as we could stand here and debate the root cause behind the problem that they had, covetousness has to be there in some amount or some degree. They lied about the money they got from the land that they sold. And as a result, they died. Number three, we learned that not all plans are of God. It's okay for us to have plans, and it was okay for this rich man to plan ahead for his life. But if our plans do not include God, friends, they will come to naught. I believe it was the psalmist who said, Unless the Lord build the house, those who build it labor in vain. Without God in our plans, our plans will ultimately crumble. That's the point of James in James 4, verses 13 to 17, where he said uh, there was a couple of people who wanted to go into such a city and stay there a year and buy and sell and get gain. And that's where he says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for just a little while, then it vanishes away. So that you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. Friends, we've got to keep God in our plans. And if you read through Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, let's take just a moment and do that. Do you still have your Bible open? I want you to see if you find a recurring theme here and see if you hear anything about God in this man's plans. He thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said... I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will restore all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have, made, uh, have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. About 14, 15, maybe 16 references to self. Not a one to God. Friends, you've got to keep God in your plans. Number four, God is the judge. Verse 20 speaks to that end where God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be that you've provided? 
Because of the things done in his life, the man would ultimately be judged by God. Romans 2 and verse 16 points that out, that God will be the judge, and we all will face that judge. And he'll even judge our secrets. He is the one to whom we must answer. Number five, it is more important to be rich toward God than to have personal wealth in life. That's verse 21 of the parable. Verse 21, where Jesus says, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We've probably all been in that position at least some point in our life where we're just storing up things for ourselves and we're buying things, we're making all kinds of money, and we're not generous toward God. And I'm not even necessarily just talking about in your church contribution. Friends, there are other ways you can be generous toward God in your blessings and and, and the things that you have rather than just your church contribution. Sure, that's good and it's necessary, but what other ways are you blessing people with the blessings God has given to you? In Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, you have... Jesus saying, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust corrupts and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves cannot break through and steal. For where your treasure is, what? For where your treasure is, what? There will your heart be also. There will your heart be also. It's more important to be rich toward God than to have personal wealth. If that means I have to be poor in life, then so be it. That ought to be our attitude. And finally, number six, lesson we can learn. It's not about me. I read to you just a moment ago the text, and we saw some 15 or 16 references to self. Personal pronouns to self, and that was his primary concern. Me, myself, and I. You know, Paul encouraged the Philippian church to get rid of that attitude. He said, on the contrary, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2 and verse 5. What mind are you talking about? The mind he described in verses 1 through 4. The mind of a humble servant like Jesus who took on flesh, left the glory of heaven, served humanity in physical life, and gave his life a ransom for many. You arm yourself with that attitude and see how your perspective on life will change. The book of Romans deals with that concept in great length beginning in chapter 12 through chapter 16. Over and over, Paul encourages the Roman brethren, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. And so let's be rich toward God. Concluding our thoughts this morning, the rich man's attitude can be summed up in the following way. He had several problems. I think there are six problems here he had. Number one, blindness. He failed to recognize the source of his wealth. God's power was behind the growth of the crops. Nothing he did except sowing and watering could produce those crops. God was behind it. So he was blind to that fact. Number two, his problem was indecision. It's evident in his statement, what shall I do? He had those around him who were no doubt hungry and poor, but he didn't know what to do with the surplus of his goods. I've got extra food on my table and one of my neighbors is hungry. I'm going to say, you come and eat with me. And not to do so would be just wrong. Number three, his problem was selfishness. The decision he finally made was in favor of himself. He hoarded his wealth. He was self-centered. Sixteen times he used the word I. Five times he used the word my. His sole concern was himself. Number four... Laziness. He had a problem with laziness because he says, I just want to take my ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Anything wrong with preparing for retirement? Certainly not. But when it's to the point where you just want to be lazy, yeah, there's something wrong with that. The Bible teaches if a man won't work, he won't eat. And sure, this man had worked for his goods, but his attitude was all wrong. Number five, he had a problem with sensuality. Eat, drink, and be merry. He was concerned about being satisfied physically rather than spiritually. And then number six, boastfulness. He said, well, now I've got many goods stored up for many years. Boasting of that fact. When the wise man said in Proverbs 27 verse 1, Do not boast yourself of tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring forth. 
Friends, I must ask you a question this morning. And I want you to examine your life honestly. Are you struggling with covetousness? And I know as I ask that question, you're thinking to yourself, no, I don't have a problem with covetousness. But look at your life objectively. Compare how many things you have at home and and how much wealth you have stored up for yourself. Compare those things to how rich you have been toward God. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a percentage of what we should give to God under the new covenant. The Bible says, give as you have been prospered. Are you rich toward God? If, if you're a Christian this morning and you're struggling with covetousness, know that you're not alone. Do I ever struggle with it? You better believe it. Because I like the things that this world has. I, I love technology. Russell and I are in the same boat. We love technology. And sometimes it's a struggle for me not to go out and blow money and waste all my money on technology. If you're struggling with it this morning, come and and seek God's word for advice. Repent of the sin of covetousness. Have, Have it washed clean and make a decision to be rich toward God. Maybe you're not a Christian this morning or perhaps you're struggling with something else. We'd love to help you today. If you have some need this morning, a spiritual need, come and let us know. As we sing the song of encouragement, come down the aisle. Let's have a talk. If you have a need this morning, do that now as we sing. On behalf of the Lawnville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road, in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come and experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity to learn about God and to become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or for more information, please visit our website at www. Again, we thank you and we hope you have a blessed day.